favorite thing. Thanks, Katie. All right, Reed Farmer has nearly 40 years of experience as an archaeologist working in CRM, program management, and contract administration. He has conducted cultural resource studies in Colorado, California, and 15 other states, and has managed a wide variety of projects, including literature and records reviews, large-scale inventories, data recovery research, and compliance efforts on large infrastructure projects. Mr. Farmer has retired from consulting and is currently working as an affiliate professor at Metropolitan State University of Denver in the Sociology and Anthropology Department. Tonight, Reed will be discussing his work in Riverside County, California at the Desert Training Center, which was established by the Army in World War II for training in field tactics. We appreciate you being here tonight, Reed, and we're excited to hear of your findings. All right. Thank you, Brittany. You can go so ahead and see here. Yeah, start presenting. Uh, it, it'll kick me off. Boom. Okay. Um, I also just want to throw in some requests to the audience. Uh, please keep yourself mu muted through the presentation. Um, we'll have a chance at the end for questions. Um, if you want to jot down your question in the chat box, we'll, we'll make sure we read it off later so that we can answer it. Okay, are you seeing also, if you have, Not yet. Um, but if you have your camera on, be aware we can see you. Um, okay, so you're not, not seeing my PowerPoint? Not yet. There we go. Okay, now I need to hit my uh, PowerPoint. There, are you seeing it? Not yet. It might be on a secondary monitor. Oh, there we go. So you are seeing it? We're seeing it in normal view. Yep, normal view. How do I go to full screen here? There's a, yeah, you could go to view. Uh huh. Tab and then uh, click presenter view. Ah. Okay. Oh, now we're seeing the notes and everything. Um, well, I'm seeing the first slide and the second slide. Yeah, we're seeing I the same. No, okay. I was going to say I have no notes, so. Huh. I mean, that works. You can fix correct. that presenter thing with changing the presenter view versus all that view in the view at the top of it. Just went through this for a different presentation. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Is that something I can control? I'm not seeing. Yeah, it should be something that's at the top of your PowerPoint screen on your end. Um, yeah. Under the slideshow view side of things. Yeah, you can, you can click the end show button in the upper center. Yeah. So how is that again? Okay, go to your slideshow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at the top bar there where it says slideshow. Not not view, just slideshow. Yeah. Uh, Hit slideshow. That, that's your, the very, very top. It, it, it says home themes tables on the, just below. Go that. to the right. Yeah. On the navigation. On the, to the right. On the slide, slideshow on the right, for the right from view. Insert, it goes view, insert, all that stuff. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. Got it? Yep. That's perfect. Woo! Nice. I'm exhausted. All right. Good night, everybody. <laughs>
<laughs> well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, this uh, has to do with one aspect of a solar power project that uh, I worked on from around 2008 to 2010 in Riverside County, California, in the desert out there. Um, I am, I will admit, uh, by training and in, in inclination more of a prehistorian, uh, but when you work in uh, cultural resource management, of course, you deal with anything you have, historic or prehistoric. Um, but I found this aspect of the project, uh, which had to do with uh, World War II era remains in the desert, uh, to be, uh, you know, fairly, a fairly interesting uh, exercise for myself. Uh, the thing is also, this project had a tremendous amount of pre prehistoric stuff on it too. We found uh, some rather uh, uh, epic uh, Paleo Indian stuff out here that hadn't been seen in this particular part of the desert before, uh, which uh, I, I actually gave in a presentation at the Society for American Archaeology back in uh, 2012, uh, which if you want to hear about that sometime, I can, I can give you that one. Anyway, this has to do with the Desert Training Center, something that is a very, very poorly known aspect of the history of World War II uh, with relates to the United States. Uh, this is an archival photo here on the uh, front slide here, and you can see some uh, M3 Stewart tanks rumbling across the desert with what looks like an A20, couple of A20 Havocs flying overhead. Um, the desert, it, when the United States entered World War II uh, in December of 1941, after the Japanese bombed us and the Germans declared war on us, um, Roosevelt and his advisors uh, decided that the priority in the war uh, should be defeating Germany. He thought that uh, Germany was a much greater threat to the United States uh, than Japan was. And he uh, directed the armed forces to prepare themselves um, with, with those priorities. So it was also pair, uh, uh, apparent to the general staff at the time that the quickest way the United States could engage uh, uh, the Nazi German army was to fight it in North Africa, where uh, the British and the Germans had been fighting for, Germans and Italians for that matter, had been fighting for like the last three years of the war. So um, General McNair, who was the chief of staff of the army at the time, gave General George Patton uh, the assignment to find a training area in the desert where United States troops could train themselves in desert conditions so that uh, when the opportunity arose for them to go to North Africa to fight the Germans, they would have some firsthand experience uh, as to what you know desert living conditions and operating conditions were. One of the other um, issues uh, that they wanted to address with this uh, desert training uh, center that was to be established is that um, the United States Army had had, of course, tanks for quite a while, had since the First World War. But the United States Army had not had armored units that operated independently. That was a new concept to our Army, and they were, quite frankly, trying to play catch up with the example that the German Panzer armor units had set with uh, you know the way that they had very quickly defeated Poland and in 1940 had very quickly defeated France. Uh, and the United States Army had not had much opportunity. It had started establishing independent armored units, but it hadn't had much opportunity to train them. So General George Patton was in command of the 1st Armored Corps, which is three armored divisions, each about 15,000 men. 
and he was sent out uh, to the California desert in uh, February of 1942 to find uh, areas that would be suitable for the training um, that he was he was being you know commissioned to undertake. And in reviewing some of the literature on this this morning and preparing for this, one of the things that that uh, I had not noted before, but I found intriguing, is that the minute um, Patton found out he had this uh, had this job to undertake, um, he realized even though he was a native Californian, he didn't have he was from the northern part of the state. He didn't have much. Uh, experience with the desert areas of California. And so one of the first things he did was he communicated with a uh, gentleman named Roy Chapman Andrews, whose name may be familiar to a number of you, who was a, uh, an explorer with the uh, American Museum of Natural History, who had led a number of expeditions into the Gobi Desert in Asia, to ask Andrews about uh, you know, any suggestions that he may have uh, about what it was like to operate in the desert. And as uh, a number of you may or may not know, anyway, Roy Chapman Andrews is is one of the models that was taken to uh, uh, come up with the persona of Indiana Jones, a sort of swashbuckling explorer. I, that tickled me today when I saw that. So, Patton came up with the idea that this would be, he, what he wanted to do was toughen his troops. That this should be, uh, you know, under very Spartan conditions, people would live only in tents. There would be the minimum of buildings built and the only buildings that were constructed uh, were administrative offices or headquarters and for hospitals. And if you look at a number of the historic photographs of the few structures that were actually put up, they were just ramshackle tar paper shacks. Uh, he wanted to, them to live as much as possible in field conditions. Uh, so he found an area, he put his wife in a hotel in Indio, California, and he found an area in Southeast in California from the uh, Colorado River West that he established as the initial training area, um, which was 18,000 square miles. Uh, later, that was expanded to areas, after he left anyway, to areas in uh, Arizona and, and Nevada. Uh, supplies were brought in by the Union Pacific and Southern Pacific and Santa Fe Railroads. Uh, one of the other things that I thought was very intriguing about this is that the Army wanted the troops to come by rail as far as they possibly could because they didn't want to truck them in uh, because tires at this point in the war were such a scarce resource they didn't want to wear truck tires out hauling people around. Uh, water for the supplies was taken from uh, the uh, Los Angeles Metropolitan Water District Aqueduct. If you ever drive I-10 uh, east, east of Los Angeles out through what's now this area that was then part of the, uh, the Desert Training Center, you can see if you look off to the north of the highway, this mound, which is an enormous buried aqueduct that carries a huge amount of Colorado River water into Los Angeles for its water supply. Um, eventually, this got built up. Uh, the entire training center got built up into 14 division size camps. So each one of these camps uh, could accommodate approximately 15,000 troops. Um, and these are spread along the desert area. And in some areas, you can still see traces of them where uh, rocks were moved away because th these were very large tent camps. Uh, but they moved the rocks away to make uh, the ground flat 
<laughs> for the floor of the tents. And the Army being the Army, they had made all the rocks come in nice straight lines. And I'm sure uh, uh, back during the war, people who uh, uh, perhaps had some uh, behavioral uh, deficiencies spent a lot of time probably whitewashing a bunch of those rocks, uh, knowing the way the Army is. One of the other concepts here, uh, just to, to emphasize, is that, that, you know, your infantry and, and, and uh, artillery and your armor soldiers all went through basic training. And at this point in the war, lots and lots of your uh, officers either came out of our officer candidate school or the equivalent of ROTC and they were trained in their individual duties. The, the Desert Training Center was uh, used to have them learn how to operate and fight as, as units um, so that everyone you know, could develop teamwork, develop skills, develop the things that they needed to know to operate as a unit rather than to operate as individuals. And the exercises that were held went all the way from uh, uh, small units, in this case, platoons, which were approximately 40 to 50 soldiers uh, uh, commanded by a lieutenant, all the way up company size, battalion size, uh, brigade size and to some even division size exercises where there would be field exercises where two divisions would operate in mock battles against themselves. Um, let's see here. Oh, one of the things that I want to emphasize here because we did. Um, um, speaks to our particular area in that looking at the document documentation uh, the resources that we have, uh, it appears that the project I'm going to be describing to you here was located in an area where small unit training exercises took place. So the, these would have been the very basic um, uh, platoon size, 40 to 50 uh, man unit exercises would have taken place. So one of the prime uh, sources uh, is a report that was written in 2000 by a, a historian named Matt Bischoff, who was commissioned by the Bureau of Land Management and the Corps of Engineers to write an overall history of uh, the Desert Training Center. Because those agencies have struggled for years as to how to deal um, on a programmatic uh, point of view with the Desert Training Center because the remains are so widespread uh, and so ubiquitous in parts of the area. It's been a real difficulty uh, for them to take care of. So as I said, our area was supposedly dedicated toward uh, small unit tactics. And I'm going to read a small section out of Matt Bischoff's report that talks about the sorts of things that they would have done. Uh, for small unit training. Uh, and I'm quoting here, perhaps one of the most important aspects of the training was the small unit exercises. Extra emphasis was placed on unit leadership, particularly by lieutenants. The headquarters had determined that small units were often instrumental in altering the course of large battle. At the DTC, platoons were given several problems which taught them to work as a unit. The headquarters desired that its junior officers be able to accept responsibility, be self-reliant, and operate on their own. Officers were required to lead a patrol over extended distances through unknown terrain, often at night, and return with information. These exercises often lasted longer than 24 hours, with the men receiving no sleep, few rations, and limited water. Officers who were unable to successfully lead these types of exercises were soon removed. So 
I just wanted to leave that as sort of a setting as to the material culture things that we're going to, to view as we, we go along here. In the big history of the Desert Training Center, um, the name was changed in 1943 to the California, Arizona Maneuver Area. And by early 1944, the entire enterprise was closed due to troop shortages. What had happened with the um, Allies having won the campaign in North Africa, having invaded and conquered Sicily, and having invaded Italy, uh, and then with the stockpiling of troops in Great Britain in preparation for the Normandy landings later in 44, the manpower demands uh, were so huge for replacement troops um, that frankly, the army was no longer putting together units that could be trained as units in the, in the desert. People were graduating, you know, finishing basic training and they were getting sucked in as replacement troops and sent to Europe. Um, so let's continue. Here is a map of the desert training, desert training center. Uh, this is out of Bischoff's report. Um, so you can see its extent. The original extent was just from the California line west, and later the areas in Nevada and Arizona were added. Here's some uh, archival photos. If you look at the photo on the left, you can see a vast tent camp back in the background. Um, you can see on the right photo some uh, half tracks that have been um, set up with what looks like 75 millimeter howitzers. Uh, another photo on the left here, you can see a bunch of tanks rumbling through an exercise. And on the right, you can see again what looks like a one, eh, 105 howitzer under a camouflage net. So the project we were working on is a large solar energy farm, uh, the Genesis Solar Energy Project, which was uh, uh, undertaken by our client, uh, NextEra Energy. Um, in this map, if you look at the yellow box on the right, that is Blythe, California, um, the sort of bluish squiggle running north south, just east of it is the Colorado River. Uh, East of the river is Arizona. Uh, the blue line running east-west is I-10. And as you can see west of Blythe, you can see a series of uh, yellowish octagons, which is where our project was. And the tan looking squiggles underneath it are is a uh, dominant feature here, uh, Ford Dry Lake, which, which is a um, periodically uh, flooded Playa. This is a closer view. Um, the octagons are, are uh, boxes up to the in blue up to the upper left are uh, areas for the solar field. Um, the red lines are areas, the boundaries of what we surveyed. This was one of the squiggliest projects I've ever worked on. They just kept changing their minds over and over and over as to you know what they wanted to try where they wanted to go um uh, they moved a lot of things north out of the dry lake bed because they were afraid it would flood and flood out their things uh, you'll see a number of linears to the lower right and those are alternative routes for what's termed the gentile line it's basically the uh, power line that would go from the generating plant down uh, and connecting to a large 500 kV transmission line that parallels I-10 down to the south. Uh, if you went out there before the project started, this is pretty much what it looks like. Nice and flat and lots of creosote bush uh, with mountains around. Uh, it's all a built up uh, operating solar energy project now though. Okay, here's one uh, classification or class, class of uh, material culture that we will discuss, which 
relates to food. Um, what we found, well, the most things that we absolutely found out there were tin can scatters. Um, and they all appear, um, as, as we could tell in looking at them, to be army food cans, army sea ration cans. And every one of these uh, appears to be where a group of folks were out doing a field exercise, stopped for lunch, ate their lunch, threw their cans in a pile and left. And here 70 some odd years later, um, they're all still there. So we spent an inordinate amount of time uh, locating, counting, and classifying all of these cans. Um, as you can see in the photo on the right, you can see one of the technicians has a, a, a metal detector so that we can find cans that were buried uh, in the sand. Um, this also says a little bit about the working conditions we had out there. Uh, we were fortunate enough to do most of our work in the winter. So you can see the technician, um, actually our field director, Jenna, uh, in the left photo who has a nice jacket on because she's there in January. And you could look at the guys in the photo on the right, and that's a picture taken in October. Uh, in October, it's still 90 degrees every day. It's starting to cool off some. Not as bad as the summer, but still pretty bad. So we spent a huge amount of time mapping can scatters. Here's some photos of individual cans. Um, if you look at the uh, two cans on the left, those are sea ration cans. Uh, the original type that had a key opener, so you can see where the key was used to, to open the strip, to open the top. Uh, and there's a screw top can in the photo on the right. And you'll see a little more in another picture here. Uh, that screw top can held uh, instant coffee. Uh, which at the time, instant coffee was called by another term, it was called soluble coffee. So at the left, you can see there's a soluble coffee can top, Barrington's. And this appears to be on the right, a supplemental spice can. It's a little can of nutmeg. Um, here are other individual food, military food cans. Here is one of the shorter cans that you'll find out more in just a little bit here. Um, these cans all came from a type of ration issued by the Army uh, during World War II um, to troops in the field who were not within the reach of a field kitchen, kitchen so that they could um, feed themselves. So this was the uh, type C ration, uh, a combat field ration uh, developed in the late 30s. Uh, and it basically came into your meal. A C ration meal was basically two cans, an M unit, which was the meat unit of the main course, a B unit called a bread unit, which had um, crackers and a bunch of other things. We'll see a little more about that. And then an accessory pack. And uh, the first large procurement of these was in the summer of 1941, but we found them all over our project area. Um, so here are, here are some uh, sea ration cans, the M unit, the main, main meals. You can see the variety uh, that they had in those. Those could be eaten either cold or heated if you had the opportunity to heat them. Uh, the B unit, uh, as you see, if you open that up, it has could have a variety of things in it. It has sugar, it has cookies, uh, it has jam, uh, it has canned cheese, um, it has juice powder, uh, all sorts of other goodies. And then there was an accessory pack which also came with it, which had cigarettes, um, salt tablets, matches, toilet paper, chewing gum. And later on, after the uh, 
uh, key type openers were discontinued later in the war. Uh, it had a can opener. Now, um, one of the things I wish I had done um, when I was working with my crew out here in like 2009 or 10, uh, and I was explaining to them the ins and outs of sea rations. Um, and I wish I had taken a picture of the expressions on the faces of my crew when I actually had to admit to them that when I was um, in ROTC and on an active duty in the Army in the mid-1970s, I had actually eaten sea rations. Um, they looked at me as though I had just told them that, uh, you know, I had a stash of mini balls uh, stashed away in my closet left over from when I fought in the Confederacy in the Civil War. It was, they were just absolutely horrified. Um, other food-related artifacts we have here are an obviously mess kit fork, you know, we were with the loop handle, and an improvised uh, coffee can. That's just a heavy, uh, heavy tin can that's been uh, expediently shaped into something you heat water in, and maybe make coffee. Clothing, uh, another class of material culture. And this is one of the oddest things that we found that took us a while to figure out. So uh, you can see the technician there plotting the location of this one. You can actually see better this artifact cluster that we found on the right picture. So what you see are things that look like two horseshoes, and that is a boot last, uh, the other metal object that you see. Uh, and the black item you see there is just a random piece of uh, uh, tire. Um, at first, I, I thought the horseshoe looking things were maybe like mule shoes or burro shoes or donkey shoes. I, I really didn't know. And having a shoe last or boot last there, um, I it didn't compute. And it took us quite a while and some research, but we finally found out that this is the remains of a boot repair kit that would have been issued at the company level uh, where you could uh, repair, your, repair the soles and heels of your boots. Uh, you, you were given material and instructions and you could use the boot last to put a new heel on your boot and these things that look like horseshoes are actually patterns that are used to cut the edges of the boot heels to size. One of the more unique things we saw. Shelter. Well, we didn't have really shelter as such. But if you look closely, um, probably you should look at the right hand photograph first. Uh, that is a foxhole, um, which is still there, still very visible after 75 years. And if you look very closely in the upper left portion of the foxhole next to that little bush that's there, if you look closely, you'll see two cans, two sea ration cans. Somebody dug the foxhole, had their two cans of sea rations for lunch, stuck it in the dirt, and later moved on. Um, you have to look very closely in the photograph on the left, and basically what that is is a sign as a line of 27 foxholes, each 10 meters apart. So this was about the size of a platoon who had uh, been instructed to dig a line of foxholes for one of their exercises. Also, uh, we found uh, just on the edge of the project area, two gun emplacements. The one that's clearest is the one on the right. Um, you can see where the dirt has been excavated out and thrown up in sort of a parapet. And the gentleman in the gray t-shirt is standing at what is the open end of the gun emplacement so that you could wheel the gun in and out. There's no dirt ridge back there. Uh, that's a similar one. Uh, you can see in the left photo, and those are about 20 meters apart. Uh, 
One of the things I found interesting when we did the file search for this is that in the 1970s, an archaeologist recorded these two, but recorded them as pit house, prehistoric pit house depressions. But they don't fit with that at all. There's no artifacts. And again, you have this open end in both of these where you could run uh, some sort of a gun in and out. Ordnance. We did find ordnance scattered. Um, this is uh, 30 out six caliber brass. Um, if you look closely at the one on the left, you'll see it has a crimped top, which means it's a blank. The crimp was held there to hold a, a paper wad um, so that you know you could you could fire it and make a nice big noise. Uh, one of the other things that we learned and got to be pretty good at it was looking at uh, uh, head stamps on the base of the brass. Um, so you look at the base of the one on the right and uh, all of the arsenals and uh, places that manufactured uh, arms and ammunition or ammunition anyway for the United States Army in the war found followed this pattern of putting in alphabet uh, initials that showed which facility had made it and uh, a two letter year. So as you look on the one on the right, it shows it's an F and an A, and at the bottom, it's a 40. So that means it's was this round was manufactured at the Frankfurt Arsenal um, in Philadelphia or outside of Philadelphia in 1940. Um, here's 50 caliber brass, and that's actually a live round technically left there. Uh, if you look at the head stamp on the base there, it's an M and a 43, which means uh, this was round was manufactured at the Milwaukee Ordnance Plant in 1943. Some other ordnance we found, there's a uh, bunch of 50 caliber, uh, cal 50 caliber machine gun belt on the left. Um, I have a theory about this particular belt in that if you look, uh, a number a number of the rounds are really very deformed. They're all bent up. Um, one of the things that was uh, located near our project area was the uh, Blythe Army Airfield. And the Blythe Army Airfield, located just to the east of us, uh, operated as a training center for heavy bombers, B-17s and B-24s. And my personal theory on, on that belt is, since it's so bent up and deformed, it probably it likely fell off of a, of a B-17 or B-24, maybe out of the waste gunner uh, locations, uh, to fall into the project area and, and get beat up like this. Uh, is, since it was live ammunition, we had to call the Riverside County Sheriff who came and picked it up. On the right side is a uh, M20 uh, practice mine, practice tank mine. Uh, this was never live ordinance. It was used to teach people. Uh, even though this wasn't live, uh, uh, we were obliged to call the Riverside County Sheriff and they uh, decided they needed to pick that up. Communications. Um, this is one of the oddest, odder things that we found. Um, one of the, if you go back to the uh, reading I gave you on small unit uh, in training, one of the other things that they had to deal with was what they called uh, use of identification panels. Um, back during this period, there were not effective uh, radio communication uh, between ground units and air units, in many cases that were su supposedly supporting them with close air support. Um, and if you, you know, read histories of World War II, you'll find all sorts of appalling friendly fire ac uh, accidents where people in aircraft shot or bombed their own people because 
they couldn't tell who was who. Uh, one of the ways in which they tried to uh, uh, fix this was to give people what were called, as I just said, um, um, panels, identification panels, so that you could take a carry around with you a large strip of canvas that was maybe painted in distinctive colors that you could lay out to hopefully let your close air support people know where you were so they wouldn't shoot you. Um, one of the variants on this was, uh, again, this was something that took us a while to figure out. We found these metal rods. You can see the one on the right that has, uh, you know, sort of an open end. Uh, and if you look on the left, you can see they're in, uh, arranged in a long line. So you would basically have uh, pairs of these that were about a meter apart from each other in parallel lines at an interval of about 10 meters. Um, and apparently during the war, this was a variant of the identification panels that was used at night. Flares would be placed on the tops of these uh, rods and lit up in distinctive patterns so that in theory, your friendly aircraft would know where you were. This was one way to signal to them. And we found a number of sets of these in the project area. As I said, this, this was right up there with the boot repair kit on trying to figure out what was happening. Uh, one other thing we had here, this is a series of tin cans, obviously, and they're all strung on a piece of heavy gauge wire. Um, during the First World War, uh, when uh, gas, gas warfare was used, um, tr troops on both sides of the war came up with all sorts of improvised warning devices of when someone cited that they were, were detected they were being attacked, attacked with gas, that they could make a bunch of noise so that people who were asleep or off duty could get up in time to put on their protective equipment. At the beginning of the Second World War, uh, there was a great deal of doubt, at least in the minds of, of the United States government, as to whether uh, Hitler and the Germans would, if they were in desperate enough circumstances, would revert to gas warfare again. So early in the war, um, the U.S. spent a lot of time training troops in, in gas warfare. And my hypothesis for this thing that we found is that it's an improvised warning rattle um, for training for gas warfare. Uh, the United States actually stockpiled quite a bit of uh, poisonous gas to use in the war, just in case, just so that they would have a uh, deterrent to uh, the Germans in case they decided to go in that direction. And actually the whole history of the uh, Rocky Mountain Arsenal has to do with that effort. It was all kicked off to, you know, manufacture poison gas for the U.S. to use in World War II in case it needed it, which luckily we did. Um, one other thing we can look at here has to do with vehicles. We found these um, Texaco uh, gas cans littered the landscape, and you can see it's been uh, punctured to use to fill uh, fill a vehicle. Those were all over the place. Um, and in areas, uh, project areas that had desert pavement, it's you can see very clearly there are lots of trackways. Um, fortunately or not unfortunately, we didn't have that much desert pavement in our project area, but in one area we did have a trackway that I measured. Um, and the hull width and the tread width fit exactly with this M4 Sherman tank 
uh, you can see that was on display at the General Patton Memorial Museum, which is in uh, uh, Chiriaco Summit, which was near the original headquarters of the uh, Desert Training Center. Uh, one other odd thing that we found, and this was just off the project area, um, near an abandoned ruined house, uh, there was an area of desert pavement where soldiers during the war had used white quartz, pieces of white quartz, uh, to pick out what appeared to be uh, unit insignia. So if you look at that one, it looks like uh, a triangle um, and I'm guessing that that might be one of the armored divisions. In this case, I've said first armored division, but all of the armored divisions had triangular shoulder flashes like that. And we know a number of them were at the DTC. Uh, this one I'm guessing might have to do with the second infantry division, the Indian head division, the star. This one I'm dead sure on. This is the uh, Ivy Leaves of the 4th Infantry Division, um, which is now stationed actually in Fort Carson. Um, so uh, just to conclude, looking at the things that we found out here, um, Matt Bischoff noted that uh, it occurred that the Fort Dry Lake, Chuckawalla Valley, where we were, our project was located, we used for small unit training. Uh, the can counts, it, all these can scatters that we found indicate that unit sizes are almost invariably less than 60 individuals. Uh, two, you know, individuals per can. We didn't get any more than 120 to 130 cans at the most, at most of those scatters. Um, the very small amount of, relatively small amount of cartridge brass that we found, um, shows that there was not any intense uh, fire between large scale units. Um, there is in the area a lack of prepared fortifications, which are seen in a number of different areas all around where we were, um, which some of those have large stacked rocks and big, still have big coils of barbed wire, things like that where major units uh, we're attacking one another in mock combat. Uh, so anyway, all of these seem to reinforce that the material remains convert, confirm uh, Matt Bischoff's uh, data that this really was used for small unit training. Um, here's a list of references. Uh, Bischoff's report, uh, our report for data recovery and um, if you want to learn more about sea rations, um, you can see this 1958 report from the Army of the Quarter Quartermaster Generals. Uh, you'll learn more about sea ration cans that you can uh, imagine. And we want to thank the client next area energy, uh, my employer at the time, Tetra Tech, uh, George Klein, who is the BLM archaeologist in Palm Springs and Beverly Bastion, who was the uh, archaeologist who was the lead for the California Energy Commission on this project. Thank you, Reed. I think we've got time for some questions, Reed, if you're uh, amenable to that. Okay. Um, if folks have questions, feel free to unmute yourselves and, and talk. You can also put them in the chat box. So I'll start off. Um, I put in the chat box when you first started, what was the name of the solar project? And you said it was the Genesis project. Mm -hmm. So I looked it up and saw that it was a concentrating solar power plant. Yes. Yeah. So I think it was like 150 megawatts or something like that. Yes. How, how did you all define the APE and what kind of direct and indirect effects did you consider? Um, our APE, quite frankly, uh, as I at least tried to allude to to begin with, um, 
varied wildly because Nextera was kept coming up with uh, issues or concerns uh, that they were that they had on the engineering side, plus on the um, uh, environmental side. Once they saw the sorts of uh, things they were getting into, they they moved the project some to try to to help themselves. Uh, other than cultural resources, the the major environmental issue for this project was uh, the fact that it was on desert tortoise habitat. You know, desert tortoise is an endangered species. Oh yeah. And um, I, it, it was sort of interesting in that uh, they paid biologists to do something like $10 million worth of desert tortoise surveys out there, and they never found a single animal. <laughs> um, and in fact, all they found were tortoise remains, and uh, the, their guesstimate after doing the surveys was that there probably hadn't been tortoise out there for several hundred years. But still, uh, the BLM said, this is desert tortoise habitat, so you have to treat it exactly like there's desert tortoise there. So they, what, what that forces the client to do is to come up with uh, what they call mitigation, um, which basically the client has to go buy land somewhere else in the desert. Uh, that is desert tortoise habitat so that it can can be placed where it will never be developed and that's usually done at a ratio of uh, three eight three acres to every acre that the project affects um, so they they moved the ape frankly was driven largely by trying to reduce the amount of desert tortoise exposure they had um, but they also realized that it was better for them to move out of the lake bed for Ford Dry Lake than it was to be down in the bottom because they had issues with the uh, you know possible flooding in future years yeah. so yeah they they came up with the design of what they wanted to do and they had to work with the Bureau of Land Management and with the uh, California Energy Commission, who were both had to, were both the certifying authorities to, to define the APE. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's really interesting. I asked because that modeling that is, is what I do. Uh -huh. um, so knowing the interplay of like CEC, um, probably involved more on the transmission side. Yes. Um, yeah, and with BLM in terms of like suitability siting, that, that's good to know. Uh, one of the things that I found infuriating was that, um, um, and this is sort of a cultural resources thing, is clients, um, well, we spent, we spent just under a million dollars for several years worth of work out there for cultural resources. Mm -hmm. And this client spent ten million dollars on desert tortoise surveys, and spent another six million dollars on uh, buying mitigation land for a species that wasn't even there. And I was in countless meetings with them where they would just, you know, complain and complain and complain and complain about what they're having, what we were having to do on the cultural side and how much it was costing them. And mm -hmm. I just remember turning in consternation once to one of the guys and saying, you haven't even spent a million for us. And you spent 16 on a species that doesn't even exist on your site. And you, you think that's perfectly fine. It's still part of the attitude that goes on in, in consulting and environmental compliance, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You're right. You know about that, Chris. 
<laughs> I do. I also, I, I think I have a very nerdy question though. Um, <laughs> so the first part of it would be um, based on how much ordinance you found out there. I mean, I guess the question is what, to the ex- what to what extent were the training exercise these small group training exercises that were going on um, were live fire exercise exercises do you believe and then the second question is about uh, those artillery emplacements that you found and I was wondering you know again when you're talking about ordnance you're talking about discarded brass like uh, like shells and whatnot yeah um, but I was wondering about artillery shells if maybe those would have been big enough for the army to have saved and reused as opposed to something like 50 caliber shells or something like that yeah i you're exactly right the 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 brass from artillery is big and it's obvious and it's all piled in a night pile in one place and it's very easy to recover Mm -hmm. so yeah that stuff got carted right away um where whereas you know, these 30, you know, 30 out six blank brass is just, you know, random here and there. And it's never, you know, you never see more than one or two, Mm -hmm. you know, within like 50 square meters anywhere. Um, I, I, you know, I know when, when, um, uh, the army does, uh, you know, target practice training at range, you know, rifle ranges, or, you know, one of the exercises that you do when you're done in the day is you go pick up all the brass, because again, it's all in one place and it's easy to get. Mm. But the, the stuff that's out, you know, widely broadcast over an area that you can't hardly even drive to, it's not worth chasing. Right. And, and so then do you think that this, that in the area that you were looking specifically that they were maybe focusing less on live fire exercises in general and more just general field skills and whatnot. I think it was, you're exactly right. I think it was general field skills. It's like, how, you know, how do you navigate cross country at night and not get lost? It's like, uh, how do you lay out an ambush? <laughs> You know, how do, how do you how do you send scouts forward to uh, reconnoiter an area where you think there's an enemy uh, in place but without being seen? How do you you know, what are the hand signals that you standard hand signals that you use to, uh, you know, communicate? You know, when you don't want to use your radio and break radio silence and, you know, you've got to be quiet, very, very basic field craft sorts of things. I've got one that I, I don't I don't know if there is enough information to to answer it, but how does the Desert Training Center compare to other World War II period training centers, um, especially like across the country in different in different environments? Well, because they're so specialized. Yeah, the, uh, there there are a lot of. Uh training areas that were used during the war that are around what what are in many cases still active you know forts or other you know facilities in in the you know eastern part of the country you could name a whole series of of you know fort jackson um fort benning fort knox all of those have training areas that were used during during the war, but are still part of the facilities. Um, whereas, again, this you know this this was an ephemeral thing that ran for three years and then everybody went away. Uh, the other thing that's unique about the DTC is the environment. Um, you know, I showed you that line of foxholes and those vehicle tracks. I mean, those are have been there for what going on seventy five 
been more years now. And they're still very easily discernible because of how stable desert environments are. Whereas, you know, when you're in a more humid environment in the east, that stuff just doesn't last, you know. Yeah, it, it looks like pretty incredible preservation. It, it And that carries through to the prehistoric stuff, too. It's, it's mm -hmm. amazing the prehistoric things that you'll see that are still there in those environments. You can see, you can see individual pot drops where, where, you know, somebody dropped a pot 500 years ago and all the sherds are still sitting on the surface in a pile. Wow. Or uh, one of my favorites that I, I, I saw, this was south of there in Imperial County, and it was an area where the... Uh, you know, the ground surface is desert pavement, so it's dark, it's black or very dark gray. And one site that we recorded there, a person had, you could see where a person had taken a core that was a, of a sort of a yellowish chert. So it was very distinctively different color. And you could see where that individual sat and had flaked, taken flakes off the core and then left the core. And you could see the scatter of flakes, you know, the debitage that came from working the core. And you could tell from the spread of the debitage, it, it sort of lobed out to the left, which meant that the person, you could tell that the person who would work the core was right-handed. And, you know, how long had that been sitting there? 500 years, 1,000 years? That's so cool. Lots, it's, it's lots of fun things to see there. Yeah. So what was the most surprising thing you found or aspect of the project? Um. The project as a whole or, or just the historic side? Whichever. I mean, maybe okay. both. Uh, yeah, the most, the the frank, frankly, here. if you leave the DTC stuff aside, um, one of the mysterious things in the California desert, um, some of you who may, who may be at least a little familiar with it, is that in the Mojave Desert, and, and, you know, more, more on the east side of the Sierras and north of where we were working, there is Paleo-Indian um, remains everywhere. I mean, it's just proverbial, the, the, the amount of Paleo-Indian material that you find in the Mojave Desert. Um, down in Riverside County, where we were, we were actually not in the Mojave Desert. We're in an area in California that they call the Colorado Desert. And it is, it is distinctively uh, geomorphically and, and uh, um, uh, habitat and vegetation wise. In the Colorado desert, which goes from about needles south into the Mexican border, is actually part of the Sonoran desert that extends from Arizona across the Colorado River into California. Um, so, but in the Colorado desert, very little Paleo-Indian material has ever been found. Uh, and we found on, it, in fact, there isn't even that much archaic material that's discernible. Uh, but in our project, we found one uh, Paleo-Indian point, a Great Basin stemmed, which dates from 14,000 BP to 9,000 BP. And we found two uh, early archaic projectile points on other sites, uh, which are five to 7,000 years ago, which was very, very exciting for us. And the BLM people were just ecstatic because they had found things like that. And again, that was the basis of the uh, paper I think I mentioned at the beginning that was, uh, I gave it the SAAs in 2012. Do you think that that positive Paleo-Indian materials is uh, 
because they weren't there or a sampling issue. My guess was much work has been done is it's, 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 it's they weren't there or we're not recognizing the pattern. Sure. They, if, it, it, they must have had a, you know, a different occupational pattern and, and, and um, art, artifact pattern than that people haven't been looking for. But it's been a big mystery for a long time. Mm -hmm. wow. I've got another one for you, Reed. Um, yes, sir. You did not mention booze. Which to me means that maybe it just wasn't cool enough to mention, or discipline was very, very good. We found no booze bottles. <laughs> Didn't find any even any beer cans. Huh. Which I, which sort of surprised me. Yeah, I, I, I'm a, a group of young men just in the desert. You, I mean, someone had to have something. I know. I know. Maybe they had it in a flask and walked it back out, but we, we found absolutely no evidence of that. Hmm. And then the, the cigarettes, uh, were those all in basically um, disposable packaging? I, I'm assuming the cigarettes didn't come in a metal tin, right? No, no, no. They, they, were, they were in like, uh, uh, what, what you got was this little paper thing that looked like a regular pack of cigarettes, except it only held four cigarettes. Even had the brand on the side. <laughs> cool. So <laughs> none of that made it. Right, right. Yeah, and no tobacco cans or even snooze cans, you know, hmm. like for people who wanted snuff. Interesting. All right, last call for questions. All right, well, I think we'll conclude the evening with that. Thank you so much, Reed. This was a lot of fun. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, thanks, Reed. Yeah, thanks, Reed. Thanks, Reed. Thanks, Reed. You betcha. Who would have thought? Blythe, California. <laughs> <laughs> I have spent entirely too much time in Blythe, California, let me tell you. <laughs> you have. Well, welcome back. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right. Bye, everyone. Everyone have a good night. Stay safe. Bye. Bye. Bye.